So um, I'm the Socialist Alliance candidate for the seat of Heffron and a long-term LGBTIQ plus campaigner and I'll chair this forum tonight. I want to acknowledge we're on the land of the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation. This land was never ceded, always was, always will be Aboriginal land. And let's first recognise that rigid gender binaries and medical definitions of male and female are colonial settler constructs and First Nations communities and their diversity, three, third spirits, genderless mimi spirits, sister girls and brother boys, show us that non-distorted human condition is one that contains varied sex and gender expressions and such, such expressions are natural and normal. And on the 50, 45th anniversary of the Mardi Gras protests at Mid World Pride, which some have dubbed Sydney's rainbow capitalism due to World Pride's grotesque level of corporate sponsorship, Social Science called this forum to discuss the next steps for the sex and gender liberation movements. We have a star-studded panel of activists, thinkers, anti-capitalist and revolutionary creatives, so I will introduce them all. We'll hear each of them for 10 minutes, then open up the floor for questions and contributions from you all on Zoom and in, uh, in the office. So first up, we hear from Mark Gillespie, a 1978 er and international solidarity activist. Mark has been liaising with queer, migrant and refugee groups on a Sydney Declaration of LGBTIQ plus rights project for World Pride and he attended the inaugural Queer Refugee Conference at Western Sydney, Sydney University. We're then going to zoom over to Kerry Bashford who is a Newcastle writer, a journalist, a performer and a committed queer activist and socialist for 40 years. Kerry has become a historian and commentator of the local LGBTQI plus struggle. Then we'll go to Skip, Blowfield Pride and Protest activist, Mardi Gras board member, industrial worker of the world, Sydney activist, and an, act and an activist who helped organise the Pride and Protest float on Sunday that included independent senator and black sovereign movement activist, Lydia Thor. Then finally, Markella will be Dr. Markella Panagrias will be a little bit late. She's the NTU Sydney branch uh, uh, branch uh, committee member, and she's also an LGBTIQ plus campaigner who helped the gender transition leave campaign in that branch. So let's take it away, Mark. Okay, thank you, uh, Rachel. I acknowledge we're on Gadigal land as we meet tonight, and I'm very proud to be on this panel. Um, and um, as a 78 you might expect tonight that I might talk about the past, but I promise you, and you'll be relieved, I'm more interested in the current days and the future than talking about the past. Um, and I, I'll just start by saying, uh, I think it was five years ago with my good friend and fellow 78 Gay Egg, we were joking that every time Mardi Gras comes around, we 78ers are going to be wheeled out as kind of like dinosaur relics, um, as evidence of long past battles. And uh, essentially what will be reduced to being is mere museum exhibits. Um, and this is something that uh, all of us 78ers really do, just do not want to happen. Um, but what I would like to say too, just going back to the first Mardi Gras, is that um, when we did stand up and re resist the onslaught of the police in King's Cross that night, in June 1978, yes, I think we're very proud of the fact that it has sparked a revolution. But what we didn't realise might happen is that people might think that the revolution had already been, been won and that now Mardi Gras would become simply a celebration and have the mistaken belief that, that all is good in the world because we've, we've reached you know, this state of nirvana as some people might um, want to feel they are living in at the moment. Um, so what I'd like to do instead um, tonight is I'll just identify some of the threats and dangers that are facing our queer communities, both in Australia and globally and maybe how queer activists uh, might be able to stand up once we identify these challenges, how to stand up to them and where some of the contradictions and the issues lie that we've got to deal with over the coming years. 
So, um, uh, just allow me though first to just give you a little assessment of the Mardi Gras parade on Saturday night. I wasn't feeling well, so I saw the whole um, march on ABC television. And, you know, it's just a wonderful, wonderful spectacle. So many community floats, it's a tremendous thing. There was a little bit of political sort of commentary. Pride in Protest uh, float was part of that. On the side of the 78ers bus, we had Russia out of Ukraine in very large letters and so on. But my assessment of that parade for World Pride is that it was a disappointment because here was an opportunity that we had to speak truly to the rest of the queer world but I think we really missed that opportunity because we didn't seize the moment on all of the issues confronting the real life is issues life and death issues that are front fronting LGBTQ plus people all over the world um, we wanted to see more representation of our multicultural queer groups. There were some which was good, but not to the extent that World Pride would warrant for us. One little uh, clip from the ABC coverage that got through that I enjoyed, amongst the Chinese queer group, the ABC camera just picked up for long enough a handwritten sort of poster on the side which read, Chinese queers stand with Russian queers and Ukrainian queers. Oh, nice. uh, but it was a fleeting little moment, but that's the sort of spirit that I wanted to see more of right across this parade. Um, particularly reaching out to continents such as Africa, which is so often forgotten. African people are looking to us, you know, the people in the Pacific and so on. Uh, another little story before I go on to look at the challenges though, and this is a story about um, Qtopia, the new queer museum. At the opening of um, World Pride, a couple of weeks ago at the town hall, the gossip all was that that morning, Murdoch had given a million dollars to this new museum, and people were coming up to me at that event saying, Yes, have you heard? Murdoch has given, you know, a million dollars to us. What's going on, you know? And um, so, as it happened, the next day I ran into um, the CEO of Qtopia Museum and uh, also uh, the great footballer um, who, who, were, who were together in the museum and I had a chance to question them about this donation and they justified it and, and were able to say, you know, you know we're, we're taking their money but we're, we're not beholden to them and so on. But this issue came up really clearly through that incident. This way that we can easily be bought off um, with money and that money still uh, has influence over our society. Then the next day, I, I went back to the little rotunda at uh, Green Park and uh, there was an impromptu sort of meeting, some high-flying people including other Qtopia board members, and we had an impromptu uh, discussion in the round. It was quite wonderful, it was spontaneous. And I, I took the opportunity and I spoke because it was in the wind then that the old Darlinghurst police station would be the new venue for this new Qtopia Queer Museum. And I spoke in some detail about what I call police-induced trauma. It's a particular syndrome, if you like. It's a particular area that hasn't been studied enough, but really important to our community and to other marginal groups that we ally ourselves with, such as sex workers and others um, on the margin. So I told this story and I said, no, we're not going to move into that bloody police station. I was there on the night, you know, and I heard the cries. We're not going to move in there. 
If we want to reclaim a site of our oppression, we only reclaim it if we do it with intent, you know, with purpose. It has to be claimed, reclaimed. But the whole sense that I was getting from this, this um, uh, Qtopia um, committee was that we would ease on down and we'll fit into that, you know, that building and that will be the site of our, of our new museum. Um, and following me was a flamboyant man my age, um, very famous, well-loved man who lived his life in the bars. Um, and um, he, um, the night of the, the first Mardi Gras, he was one of those who would have come out, and, but in his own way a real hero, but he would have come out in 78 and said, to us marching in the street. Get a life, you rat bags. What are you doing out in the street? All you do is protest. Get a life, you know? Um, this was the attitude of a, a lot of our people then, queer people, uh, and probably he was one of them. And he told lovely stories at this little gathering at the Rotunda there in Green Park. And uh, amongst his stories were people he'd slept with and um, famous, people and, uh, and the Aubrey and Capriccios and every sort of landmark institution of our long Oxford Street history. Wonderful guy. Um, really, you know, flamboyant and dressed in beautiful colours and all the rest of it. And just at the end of his speech to this little gathering, he said, oh, wait a minute. One day, way back, I think it was in the early 80s, I was wearing hot pink pants, pink pants, um, and I was just finishing my shift at the bar, and I was picked up by the police and I was put in Darlinghurst Police Station overnight. Mm. And when I got home to my share house in Darlinghurst, all, all my friends I was sharing with said, we don't believe you're in the, in the clink, you've just been out, you know, fucking all night or, or whatever. Um, and um, so this, this for me was a breakthrough in terms of yarning and getting each other to sort of begin to think about things in a different way. I seeing through his eyes, he seeing through my eyes. We're both queer. We've got a lot in common, even though we're, we're different in, in, in so many ways. And he said, he come up to me and said later, um, yeah, that's the first time I've ever told anyone since then that I, I, you know, I was in that jailhouse for, you know, overnight that night. So the challenges that we face, I see, I'll go quickly now because I know um, time is, is running, the challenges or threats, I see on the one side there's neo-fascism. This could be called political homophobia and transphobia. So homophobia and transphobia used as a weapon and we who are queer, we are easy prey. And we can be pawns in big struggles that are going on. In fact, this is what's going on. So this is a real threat. And don't think that it exists only in authoritarian countries. It exists everywhere. Look at what Morrison tried to do with the trans story just not even a year ago in our country. Um, so the threat from neo-fascism, I'll call it, it's kind of like a rolling fascism, as Marsha Gresham, I think the, the Russian academic calls it, a rolling fascism that we've had to deal with all these years now, since the 1930s. But on the other side, you've got neoliberalism. We, we used to talk a few years back about homo-nationalism, which the Israelis were the best sort of exemplars of. Um, using this progressive sort of front to show the world how wonderful their, and modern and progressive their country was uh, by saying, look, we've got our freedom for our queer people in the streets. Look how happy, happy, happy queer people are in our country. While at the same bloody time, having, you know, a horrendous apartheid system where Palestinian people are, are, are kept out. Um, so 
this kind of neoliberalism is much, in some ways, it's, it's a very insidious thing because it can be done in very subtle ways, like the Murdoch story I just told before. You know, that we can easily be sucked in and feel that we're, we're really going to be part of, um, you know, a comfortable bourgeois existence. All we have to do is become depoliticized. All we have to do is to be, I guess, desanitized, if you like. You know, you gays and lesbians and so on, you, you, we're not so comfortable with you. If you become more like us, straights will accept you. So this is the kind of thing that, that is happening in, particularly in our country at the moment. Back in the 70s, 60s and 70s when I was young, we fought not just for equality, even though we know that equality is important, we fought for the right to be different. And that's, that's a key point that I'll make. Now just one third other threat that's really important, I'll say quickly, have I got a minute to go or so? Yep, um, two minutes. I would like to point out in our own nation that the religious right is not done with. Don't ever think that, you know, we've won the battles against anti-human ideologies, such as those perpetrated by religious groups. And I'm not picking on Christians. Please, if you're Christian, don't think I'm just picking on you. All three Abrahamic faiths in particular need to be called out equally, in my opinion. And then we need to move on to Hinduism, Buddhism even. You might wonder why, but I'm saying yes. We have to be wary of these faiths which will always try to um, gain their faith by through fear and that's where we come in because you know we're the type of people that um, your parents are going to warn you against so here are some of the contradictions now um, please if you're part of pride in protest don't um, I'm going to list these quickly don't become a slacktivist I really fear that young people now are going to retreat out of the streets. If you want to protest, yes, online digital po protesting has fabulous opportunities. You know, the, the amount of distribution of information quickly to so many people is wonderful. But don't retreat from the streets. I think it's the streets, as we see in Iran at the moment, where, where we need to make a difference. Um, Another key contradiction or point to raise is bringing in the marginal voices and those on the edge. If you look at World Pride, we've failed here. And this is a class issue, I think. You know, people who are on the margins, people who can't afford to get in, there's no accessibility. You know, we're getting back to those issues of class. Homeless people, you know, where is World Pride leadership? in calling for housing for homeless queer people. If you go to King's Cross near where I live, half or more of the homeless people are most likely queer from what I can see. And this, is, this is the worry that I have. Um, and another issue that I would raise here is the human rights work. There are real contradictions here because we live in the anguish of a broken world in terms of international politics. That United Nations that we had for so long as a trusted maybe s s backstop for our human rights is no longer. We have one member of the Security Council armed to the teeth with nuclear weapons who is invading, you know, a neighbour. and the whole apparatus of that United Nations is now really weakened by what's currently underfoot. Can we trust or believe or should we be working for United Nations sort of human rights work? These are big issues that we're going to have to deal with as we go forward.
police is another contradiction um, that we have to deal with at the moment. I have publicly called for a pause in the New South Wales police being permitted to march in our parade every year. And I, I do that particularly this year, and it was a lost opportunity because that upper house inquiry into hate crimes against gay men in the New South Parliament has provide, provided all the evidence we need to know that we can't trust what the police say. We thought we were developing a relationship. We've got GLOW officers. We've had years of, of coordination with them. But we've reached the point now where we've got to say no. That internal racism within the, the force and homophobia and transphobia has to be called out and stopped. And why, how, what moral right do we have to stand with our Aboriginal brothers and sisters, sister brothers and, and uh, sister, um, brother brothers and sister sisters, what right do we have to look them in the eye when we know that um, there are continued deaths in custody? Um, so these are some of the issues that, that uh, I will raise for you tonight. Um, and uh, there is so much work to be done. Thank you. Thanks, Mark. I was part of um, the most recent Mardi Gras, um, which has uh, recently hit uh, national news. Uh, thank you. Uh, thanks to one of the members of our float, uh, Senator Lydia Thorpe. But I want to kind of like give a bit of background onto what informed her actions, our actions, and our stances. Um, so on our float, we uh, led with the banner, which echoed a chant from 1978, stop police attacks on, uh, on, um, on queers, gays, women and blacks. And I think that this, I, this solidarity has, uh, was one of the reasons why we invited uh, Lydia, um, who is heading the uh, sovereignty campaign um, as we speak, um, to our float where we are uh, constantly trying to fight to get the police, the very same institution that uh, had some conspiracy that the hate crimes inquiry um, was uh, due to the bias of the, some gay agenda um, in academia. Um, the same institution that brutalized the 78ers, um, trying to get them out of, uh, out of Mardi Gras. Um, and there is, a, there is a intersection between the white supremacy, which keeps down the First Nations, the patriarchy that oppresses women, and the, um, and the, the heteronormativity that, um, that discriminates against gays and trans people everywhere. Um, it should be uh, noted that at the First Mardi Gras, um, there were uh, uh, First Nations people there in solidarity. Uh, some who came to the Darlinghurst uh, uh, jail to call for the uh, release of those who were detained there. Um, and in this, there was kind of, there's this like common struggle, um, even to this day. Uh, this can be seen, for example, in um, uh, in uh, unjust incarcerations. So, despite being less than three percent of the population. Indigenous Australians make up a quarter of our prisons, uh, of our prison population. Um, despite being around 4% of the population, lesbians make up 37% of uh, female prisoners. This is the sort of like structural, um, uh, systemic sort of oppression that still remains today. And it's no wonder then that um, there would be such animosity to the police. Uh, to the police who, in the um, who in the parade, uh, real like they like it's not only just a security thing, and it's not only just um, a, a um, their representation in the in the float. Although that is also quite disgusting. Um, I threw up in my mouth when I saw the words "fab fed," for example. Um, it's, <laughs> yeah. It's also the um, it's also the uh, the uh, lack of um, privacy that people have. It's the uh, indignity that people go through. 
the sniffer dogs, the decency checks, the strip searches, sometimes on minors, right? This is like, like their, their, um, their presence at Mardi Gras is, um, is, is actually oppressive. Um, it would be like a mere reflection, for example, of the military occupations that are happening in remote communities um, that you know, were rolled out in the same decade that Kevin Rudd said sorry. Um, it was, and I should also note that there's a bit of a crime scare happening in the top, in, in the top end now, and we should be uh, wary of what uh, the Albanese government's going to do on that front. Um, and we also saw this at its worst with the death of Veronica Baxter um, in 2009. Um, Veronica ba Baxter was a, tran was a trans woman, was a black woman, and she was brutalised by the police. She was detained in a male prison in which she died. Since then, we have made accord with the police, which I think is the most disgusting thing that you could have done, um, which happened, I think it was either 2014 or 2015 when that was uh, nailed down as a regular thing. And um, th knowing that with the hate crimes inquiry, right, that we still have police call it at effectively after being found out to not only uh, being enabling of these hate crimes, but being complicit in these hate crimes, being that there were officers, constables, like badge carrying, uh, gun carrying, blue uniforms who killed gay men, right? Um, and that, uh, that they are still in denial of that now, and that we've made peace with them. That is the most disgusting thing that I could possibly think of. Really, there. So now back to the present day of what uh, of the of the brave um, of the brave uh, actions of uh, uh, Senator Thorpe recently. So she uh, she disrupted the uh, parade more than actually the float did. So the float uh, decided to stop for a good two minutes at Taylor Square. Um, we slowed down all along uh, Oxford Street and caused uh, quite a few disruptions. Lydia Thorpe um, bravely uh, for um, about 300 metres uh, disrupted uh, and confronted the police, her and her good friend. Um, and the coverage of this in the media, largely by the right wing media, has been an absolute beat up. The idea that she was antagonistic to the queer community for doing this, where I think I, I think the best take of this is one should not be um, surprised that there was a protest at something commemorating a protest. This is the sort of uh, this is the sort of like idea that we have to keep alive, right? That this is a resistance. Um, it's been said a couple of times that um, oh well, Mardi Gras has become a celebration, and I think you know what, in a way, uh, Mardi Gras should be a celebration. And also in a way that even the first Mardi Gras was a celebration. The reason why is in an oppressive cis-heteronormative patriarchy, those queer people, those people who are not gender conforming, those who don't fit very well into the social structures that have been set for us, they, to celebrate that, that is a protest. It's one and the same. I think I should also mention some of the structural issues with, um, with Mardi Gras. Um, so as a member of Pride and Protest, I have been elected uh, as a board member. And having seen uh, what's going on in the inside, it's even worse than you'd think. Um, those accords, those had last minute um, adjustments by the New South Wales Police Force without any consultation with the community. And apparently they were bad enough for them to go through internal review. But the board never actually got to see them. Such was the lack of transparency. Someone who would have seen them was, would be the CEO, uh, Albert Kruger, an individual who has been seen with the Liberal Party, who is a frequent of Liberal Party members. Liberal Party members, uh, would, I would remind you, would include Catherine Deves, who has compared comprehensive sex education to the Holocaust, um, who has effectively um, try to import this uh, groomer rhetoric of 
drag queens mm. here to our shores. Uh, what a lot of what um, the new uh, our news kind of drowned out was another a news event that happened where there was a drag story time. Um, luckily, a lot of the uh, a lot of the community came out and uh, made sure you know none of those children uh, were confronted by such hate. Those people who were out there though included members of the far right uh, uh, political group, the National Socialist Re uh, uh, Network. That's effectively like what we're kind of dealing with, right? In Mardi Gras, at its leadership, we have people who are sharing a party who, has, who, have, who platforms uh, speakers that sympathize with Nazis. That's how bad the rot is in Mardi Gras. What Lydia Thorpe did was an excellent uh, large public show of resistance. Um, in that way, pride and protest, and I hope every radical stands in solidarity 100% with what she did. Because with, it's gone, it's like, with this degree of commodification, um, it's, uh, it's effectively a shell of its own self. It's almost insult to call it the same word, Mardi Gras. Um, even to the degree where we tried to get, where we successfully got uh, American Express uh, out as a corporate sponsor. This, by the way, this is a company that outed sex workers to the police. Sex workers who are disproport who, so sex workers are disproportionately uh, represented by queer people. Um, so effectively, anyone who outs them to the police is an enemy of queer people. And even then, they got around that by, of course. Well, American Express is not a uh, sponsor of uh, Mardi Gras, it's a sponsor of World Pride. <laughs> such, is, such is their dishonesty. Really, they, the profit motive of those in charge of Mardi Gras is so, is so single-minded and so vile that they would betray the, um, the community that they claim to represent. Um, so yeah, I'll just leave you with this. Um, anti like like so uh, anti-colonialism uh anti-patriarchy um and uh anti-capitalism are all part of the same structure of the same struggle that queers have and if we want to uh if we want to find liberation for one of them we got to liberate all of them because it's the same structure thank you everyone Thanks. Thanks. thank you my name is terry bashford uh, my pronoun for he and him i'm coming to you from Mullumbimba. Uh, Wabakal Land um, from the uh, Newcastle Resistance Office. You can see some of comrades in the background if my hefty frame can get out of the way. Yes. Um, yeah, that was a wonderful speech. I, I really got so much out of that. I'd like to hear it all again. Um, but uh, I just made a few comments about um, sponsorship in Mardi Gras is essentially what I'll be talking about this evening. It's that time of year in Australia where every clear around here feels valued, loved, and lovable. We're in the middle of the Sydney Mardi Gras season, stretched out even longer in 2023 by the presence of world pride on our shores. Sydney Mardi Gras is now in its 45th year, older by now than many of its participants. It is a firm and fixed position on the, on the Antipodean calendar. It's actually older than Australia Day, that divisive date which disgracefully celebrates European invasion of this country and the genocide of its first people. It's only been running since 1995. The first Mardi Gras was in 1978, and those who attended the first Mardi Gras march and subsequent protests are what we now lovingly call 78ers. We have seen Sydney Mardi Gras go from a riot to a parade, from winter protest to a summer celebration. We've seen it transform from a street skirmish to the biggest outdoor event in the country, the biggest community event, the biggest tourist destination in the late Australian summer. I doubt that the 70s could have imagined the scale and the impact that Mardi Gras has had on Australian lives and politics. What cannot be measured is the impact that it has had on queer individuals, the many lives and experiences that were inspired and made possible by it. But seriously, could any of those legs be brutally thrown into the back of police wagons in 1978 ever have imagined their actions would one day be venerated in upscale corporate events with canapes and cocktails? 
Could any queer beaten up by police that night ever have thought that they will one day rub shoulders with business leaders, dignitaries, politicians, as the halls of power open to them in a more welcoming embrace than they were to receive on that brutal winter night? Most of all, could any of those rev rebels and revolutionaries have imagined that fighting with police for the right to protest, to be heard and seen, would one day be co-opted into mainstream marketing landscape as a vital part of the annual spreadsheet for the average blue ship company? Could any of those brave rioters have imagined that one day their bravery would be branded and their historical actions will be remembered not by ongoing protest and enduring activism, by, but by closely choreographed hall centre workers drearily dancing in formation up Oxford Street in worship, worship of whatever brand name is on the banner or the back of that fucking truck. <laughs> One thing you can be sure of is this. This was not what they imagined by the slogan of the night in 1978 at the original Mardi Gras, out of the bars and onto the streets. Could any of us have imagined all this? Well, you could if you were hanging around in the 80s and 90s. I was not only an activist back then, but a member of the emerging queer street and zine media. I had a front row seat in the 90s as editor of Campaign magazine. At the time, one of the oldest gay magazines in the world, itself a recipient of the first wave of those glossy advertising dollars. Back then it was called Pink Dollar, and it was it virtually paid my wage. But soon it would seep into other aspects of community sponsorship and would not, it was, it's not an exaggeration to say the queer community has become a slave to the corporate dollar. The Sydney Mardi Gras has become a ringing example of this trend. And as it has grown over the years, it's relied on its model of corporate sponsorship, often above government support is guaranteed that, that we are tethered to the whims of the market more than the needs of the community. An organisation and event like Mardi Gras gives off membership fees, the success of its events, a degree of local government support, local and state government support and significant corporate support. This means that the LGBTIQ community and the culture that it attempts to sustain is particularly vulnerable to capitalist ownership and influence, which is being practised through stealth with profiteering parading as allyship. It is a way of courting profit through stolen glory, through our stolen glory, through commodifying queer culture, diluting our culture, compromising our signifiers, slap a rainbow on it, and everything is accepted and forgiven. The LGBTI community is one especially susceptible to the influence of this kind of corporate appropriation. Our history as a people is long, but our life as a community is short. We're only a couple of generations old. We have no historic generational wealth, little in the way of capital or infrastructure, community capital or infrastructure. Under capitalism, even in this period of relative progress, in fact, particularly in this period, we are made slaves to the largest of corporations, especially when governments fall back up, uh, fail to back us. Given this lack of financial autonomy, we are particularly vulnerable when corporations come calling. The willingness of the LGBTI community to receive that support is not surprising. We are as worthy as anyone to receive the dividends of the spoils of capitalism, but it might be worth investigating the intentions of both sides. The sponsor of an event or organization like Mardi Gras, for instance, not only gets much needed cash, but mainstream approval. The business, however, gets back something more precious than gold, a reputation, a responsibility, a respectability of sorts. Oddly, and it's coming from a community that was once considered the least respectable of all and least likely to be subject to the kind of support we get now. By allowing corporations to sponsor us, we have given them worth in the woke economy, in the global village of ideas where, where we all, corporations included, or corporations especially, need to be on the right side of history. One of the ironies in this late stage of capitalism is that business can seem more progressive than governments. The marriage reform campaign was a great example of this. 
What motivates businesses to buddy up with a community once reviled and adored in, in, living, in, in living memory? It's partly a desire to bask in our reflected glories, in our achievements as a community, partly to make themselves more palatable. But in the end, there is only one motivation that will satisfy, and that is profit. Indeed, a significant part of the reclamation and reformation of the LGBTI community has been in the eyes of business, where we have been transformed from outlaws of capitalism and outliers of patriarchy to consumers in agents for profit. We are subject to sponsorship courted by corporations who vie for the right to fly the rainbow flag next to their own. One could almost chart the increasing acceptance of queers and culture by the increasing corporate involvement in our customs and lifestyles. The issue that should be concerned to be social with queer is that Mardi Gras and community, community events like it exist largely, largely on corporate sponsorship. Sorry. Indeed, Mardi Gras seems almost proud of its relative lack of government sponsorship over the years. And its attempt at autonomy should be acknowledged, but it's not an autonomy that transfer allegiance from government support to corporate dependence. What do we get from the exchange is to have the stamp of approval of the market, to be, seen, be perceived as goodwill consumers and pliable products, to be allowed to wear logos like branding on beef. All our lives, are our lives enhanced by the recognition and financial support of these leeches? Consider for a moment how easy it is to be a corporate ally. Lap a rainbow on your ass and you're well on your way, but what, what really what further commitment are these corporations required to offer? They don't even have to provide anything as distasteful as queer representation. No need to enhance the visibility by depicting actual human beings when you can just lap a rainbow on it. We have been re reduced to a cartoon and our flag and all other forms of iconography that stand as a symbol for our struggle and now a symbol of our assimilation. Thank God the rainbow flag came along. Can you imagine how difficult it would have been to market the pink triangle? <laughs> how did we go from being an object of such derision to an object, object of such economic value? That's made the story for another time. But what I do want to do here is to ask you a question, not one you'd expect to be asked in this context. And that is the question that capitalism asks you every day, how much are you worth? Because capitalism assigns your worth every day, every minute, and that can be assessed by how much it wants your dollar and how much that transmit, transaction is worth to them. And when queers engage with corporations, there is so much more to exchange than usual people. It's not just them stalking out a new market. It's an attempt to earn the trust of new markets to future-proof themselves to criticism, cancel culture, to appear as one of the cool kids, to profit from our good name. How much is our name worth? How much can it be squandered? How much can it be surrendered? How much can it be devalued before it hollows out the victories of those who went before us? The 78s, Camp Pink, Gay Rights Lobby, Gay Solidarity, a, a few of them who fought for our lives, recognised, not a, they, they, they fought to have our lives recognised, not have our lifestyles recognised, not or a, our earning capacity or our market value for that matter. Is this how we saw the revolution going? That the revolution would not be televised until it had adequate corporate sponsorship. Mm -hmm. Do we want the movement to have cost careers and lives and reputations to become the marketing plaything for shadowy sleaze bags whose only object is profit, profit, and profit? So where do you stand in the commodification of gay culture? Ask yourself, how much am I really worth and how much am I prepared to fight for my real value as a human being and a proud revolutionary and queer? Thank you. Thank you, comrade. Both talks very engaging. Um, I want to acknowledge that we're meeting today on Gadigal land. And sovereignty was never ceded, always was always will be Aboriginal land and full solidarity uh, for Lydia Thorpe and her powerful action. I wanted to mention the words of 
trans, non-binary, derogatory scholar and activist Sandy O'Sullivan, who says, gender, like many imposed binaries, is a colonial construct. In the continent of so-called Australia, where the Wiradjuri people and several hundred other indigenous communities reside, binary genders were recorded to manage the reproductive ordering of Aboriginal bodies. As late as the 1970s in some jurisdictions, colonial rule controlled our movements, our right to marry, our access to health and education, our work and money, and it dictated that our children be forcibly removed from our families, often never to return. Gender mattered to colonial forces because it existed as a site of control. It's reasonable to assume that those who lived outside the binary gender containers were erased from the record. Okay, so there's not only the oppression and the dispossession and the genocide, but also the erasure of um, queer um, First Nations people and their lives in this country. So uh, just a little bit about me. Um, I'm an artist and an academic. I'm a queer bisexual person and my pronouns are she, her. So um, thinking about what Skip and Mark and Kerry have said, you know, it is a it is well applied and Mardi Gras seems full of, not seems, are full of hypocrisies and contradictions. Primarily, how can we talk about world pride when there's about 68 or 69 countries which criminalise um, homosexuality? And this is, that, that, was, that statistic was in 2022. There's definitely been a capitalist and global geop geopolitical hijacking of queer culture. Um, you know, and according to the UN, um, notwithstanding the issues that Mark raised about the UN, so they say, and this is a conservative statement, you know, they, LGBTQI plus people continue to face widespread stigma, exclusion, discrimination, in education, employment, healthcare, within homes and community, as we know that targeted attacks, physical violence, um, beaten, sexually assaulted, murdered, and there's also major um, horrors faced by queer refugees. Um, there's also the legal struggles of queer and trans people to get some semblance, semblance of rights. Uh, in most countries still to date, um, trans people have no access to legal recognition of their gender identity, okay, which is a, a fundamental human right. Uh, or they face abusive requirements um, to get recognition. Even here, for a long time, it's been that you had to prove medical um, gender um, reassignment surgery to get your legal recognition of a change of gender. And that's an abusive kind of situation. Um, there's also the issue of intersex children being forced to undergo medically unnecessary interventions. Um, so everywhere it seems, um, and you know, there's no country I can think of where maybe Cuba has a, has a better situation right now with their new um, family act code. Um, everywhere the law fails really. Um, so hence the need for our grassroots action like Pride and Protest um, and other protests, um, you know, globally. So one such uh, protest on a smaller scale, but still has repercussions for what we can achieve globally is our struggle for self-identification and health care and just a general kind of respect in the workplace in Australia. And um, as I mentioned, I'm, I teach at university um, 
and I'm, so I'm part of the National Tertiary Education Union. And um, led by a, a really great staunch activist at Sydney University, Sophie Cotton, who's a trans woman, um, there's been a really great uh, fight for gender affirmation leave. And queer activists um, such as Sophie in the union have been working really hard for transgender rights within the union and you know, within the workplace. Um, so there's a number of issues that they've been raising. So um, there's the issue of gender critical ideology, which you might have heard about in the news. So um, queer activists in the union have, um, you know, set a set a motion that, that um, to recognise formally in the union that so-called gender critical ideology, when used to defend transphobia, is is not consistent with academic freedom. So if you don't know the backstory, but if you don't know, basically, there's a lot of trans inclusionary radical feminists out there who use this term gender critical ideology as a kind of front for attacks on trans people. It's not um, it's not at all academically sound by any means um, but they, they try to sell it as academic freedom. Um, and then the other major issue is uh, gender affirmation, so this means support, leave and care, as I mentioned. And uh, last year, the National Council of the NTU uh, passed a resolution that all uh, branches of the NTU would um, fight for gender transition leave and to fight for a claim for 30 days per year for the purpose of affirming one's gender. So, so far there's been, there has been some success, which is really great, especially in the University of Tasmania, which have granted staff 30 days per annum. Other universities have granted a bit less, um, but there is a movement to strengthen that. Um, then in the recent, if you've probably forgotten it, it was a big thing and then it was like disappeared off the agenda. The Secure Jobs Better Pay Act from last year, which was very um, problematic for a number of reasons within, in terms of industrial um, action, the ability for workers to take industrial action. Uh, nevertheless, it had some good aspects in it regarding um, equo gender equality. So um, now um, the, let me just check this. So um, protected attributes under the Fair Work attribute previously were only race, color, sex, sexual orientation, age, and marital status. But now it includes gender identity, intersex status, and breastfeeding. So now, um, if you're discriminated against in the workplace for those reasons, um, you can um, go to the fair, fair work and you know, take action, basically. Um, you get to see it in practice, but anyway. Um, so at University of Sydney, um, we um, are in enterprise bargaining. It's very, been very painful and protracted. Um, and Sophie um, put forward our 30 days paid affirmation, affirmation transition leave per annum in our log of claims. Um, and the reason you might be wondering why 30 days, why per year, um, it's because these essential um, transition steps and procedures, um, then it's not just one surgery or one procedure. A lot of people don't want to necessarily do a surgery. They might just want to have psychological um, support. They might just want to take time off to reflect and then come back to the workplace, you know, saying this is how I identify now. 
Um, there's also legal issues that a lot of trans people have to deal with. So 30 days per annum is actually quite conservative, um, especially when you consider if you do go down the route of surgery, you know, recoveries from surgeries can take six to 12 weeks. Some surgeries um, for transition can act actually need to be done in stages over a number of years. So the per annum claim recognises this. Um, so Sophie says that, you know, we don't want to just focus on medical genital surgery um, because it's important that, you know, leave validates all forms of gender affirmation and that includes social transition and legal transition. Okay, and, in, and she says also that in the terms of the question of annual leave, there's a common misconception that transition is a one-off process, rather it's an ongoing process that can see many shifts, different surgeries, different medical appointments, a changing body and a changing um, kind of set of things to deal with. So in fact, the annualised leave thing is really quite essential. Um, so at Sydney University, Sydney University has agreed to 30 days of leave all up, okay, so that's 30 days off, um, but that's, so it's a good start. I'm surprised, 30? surprised. 30. It's a good start. 30. 30. So that, they've agreed to it, but not per annum. Oh, okay. Okay, so that's, that's the catch. Okay. Uh, so they, they've sort of come halfway to the table in, in a kind of corporate style they'll be like okay so they've so we need to fight for the to be annual um sydney uni has done this doggy thing where they they've said to so far in London, they've said Look, we can do the 30 days and then you can take up your other annual leave if you need more over the course of your employment um so it is a step forward but it's it's not enough because as i've try to explain gender affirmation leave is ongoing process. Um, but you know it is in some ways it's a, a testament to the work of Sophie and other activists on campus and our strikes last year that we have actually got the university to make that concession. And the point is that hopefully that will and it already has encouraged other activists at other universities around to fight really hard for the same um, lead. Um, so the fight at Sydney Uni continues. In fact, we have a we have a strike next week on Thursday. So and you know, please come and support us on our picket lines. So that's kind of what's happening here in Australia. There's there's a little bit of progressive movement within the unions to have better conditions um, for trans people. And um, just want to uh, mention that, in, to finish up with that, in Spain, um, you might be aware that they've recently passed some really progressive laws. Um, so it, it guarantees access to sexual and reproductive rights. It makes it much easier for trans people to change their gender without having to prove or show anything. So self-ID, self-identification is one of the key demands of, of you know, a lot of trans activists. Um, you know, there's, you shouldn't have to prove this in a medical way or any way. Um, in Spain, they've also um, expanded access, access to abortion procedures and they've also granted menstrual leave. Okay, so, um, and they've also allowed um, women as young as 16 or 17 to undergo abortion without parental consent. Mm -hmm. So there's some really good things happening there in terms of bodily autonomy. Um, and you know, it's it's um, it sort of gives one a little bit of hope. Thanks, comments. Well,